Hey everybody, uh, this is Jeff, and this is actually our very last live coding session. Um, it's coming up on week 14 uh, in class today, so um, there's no sense having uh, a video to uh, prepare you for anything in week 15, so um, this is going to be it, because this is your last week uh, toward working on your final assignments. So. Um, as you may recall, last week uh, we were working on our uh, collision detection, and I didn't get quite as far along through that as I would like to because I wanted to talk about debug draw and the idea of being able to um, give you a way to sort of identify where your physics objects are uh, compared to what your textures sort of say. Um, you know, what, what your textures look like, because those things aren't necessarily the same thing, and it can require a little bit of tuning to get them to be exactly the same thing. So I wanted to introduce you to that, and just sort of quickly look that over, um, and then move on to uh, collision response and uh, making something work for that. So... Um, if you recall, last week uh, we simply put this thing together where in our update we are calling test collision and we are um, we are checking to see if uh, if the collision happened and just sort of simply printing this out on the console. But um, I've added in the debug draw features here and I just want to take a quick look over those. Uh, they may look a little bit complicated to you, but I'll let you at least see them. So if you want to copy them down, I mean, feel free to do so. Um, what I've done here um, is if I play this, and you can see what this looks like. So you can see these little green circles surrounding these. That's basically the only difference, and that they turn red um, when a collision is happening. So let me run that one more time. So if you're looking at the console here, we've got our 0 and 1. So the 1 comes out when they're in collision, and so that coincides when they turn red. Um, so the major thing that happened inside my, um, my assignment 4.h here is that I have this uh, precompiler um, statement here, this if debug. Um, so basically, I'm, I'm checking to see if this debug um, precompiler define is set, and if it is, then I will run this code. Basically, if I'm colliding, then I'm calling some debug draw function on the ball and on the peg. Uh, in this case, I'm passing ff for red, 0 for green, 0 for blue, and ff for opacity, so I'm saying draw red when it's colliding, draw red for the peg when the peg is colliding. Um, and otherwise draw green. So it's zero red, FF green, zero blue, and full opacity. So that's the idea there. So the debug draw function is kind of the bulk of this. Um, and so I've added some things into game object in order to support this. Now, this is a little bit hacky, but it's good enough um, for the sake of what you guys are doing. Um, so if you need a way of debugging well, like where your, your colliders are, uh, this is something that will help. Um, I should also note that I'm doing this, this draw um, after I've rendered the textures, which means that it will draw on top. Um, so that's, that's something that um, you may find useful. Uh, yeah, so in game object, um, I've just added a define here for this, this debug. So basically what this is going to control is if you switch debug to false, for example, and I run this, um, all the debug draw features just go away, so it no longer draws this, so that if debug that was in our assignment 4.h here, um, you'll see that that code grays out. Um, that simply means that this code is not going to exist in the compiled version. So precompiler statements let us control um, sort of conditional compilation um, is often what it's referred to as. Um, so we can make certain chunks of our code just kind of go away. I'm going to switch that back on. Um, so you'll also note here, I added another member here, which is also conditionally compiled. 
it is an array of 360 SDL points, uh, these debug draw points. And uh, I would, I kind of wish that these could be vector threes, but in order to support um, the debug draw feature that I want to add on, I have to use this SDL point in order to do this. Basically, it's just a point with an X and a Y, and that's it. Um, SDL supplies this for us and it expects to get it. Um, basically, I'm just storing this array so that I can use them to draw a whole bunch of points later on. And I'm going to be computing these each frame um, when I'm in debug mode. You should also note that this eats up a ton of memory. Part of like 360 points is a lot bigger than any of the other things in here. It soaks up quite a bit of space. Not that we need a whole lot of memory for our program, but if you were going to build something for real, you really don't want to be wasting memory on debug features like this. So conditional compilation for stuff like this can be very good. Um, and lastly, I've added in a debug draw function here. Um, so very much like the render, it takes in a matrix for MVP matrix, and then it takes in the color that it wants to render in. And by default, it renders in opaque red. Um, so, like I say, I'm just going to look this over kind of quickly because this debug draw function is fairly beefy. Um, now, I'm just going to give a quick look at this. So this is the whole thing. Again, this whole function is wrapped in this if debug. So if, um, if our debug flag is off, this just simply doesn't exist in the compiled game. And basically all that we're doing here is we're getting the renderer that we want to draw to. We're getting the um, render draw color that's currently set so that we can save that. The reason that we're saving that, if I double click on this art old, you can see where it's being used. So I'm basically getting the render draw color and reading the red, green, blue, and alpha into these values here so that after I set the color to whatever was set here, I can then set it back afterwards. So I'm doing set render draw color at the end setting the renderer back to the old color. So most of this stuff is sort of surrounding just uh, getting the renderer, uh, figure out what color the renderer is currently set to draw in, um, set the renderer to the new color, and then at the end, um, set the renderer back to whatever color it was set to, just so that we don't screw up something someone else is doing, maybe. Um, that's basically what I'm trying to stick to there. So the bulk of what's happening are these lines here. So remember how we had 360 points. I've got for loop that's going from 0 to 359. Uh, basically, what this is going to do is just for each sort of one degree around the circle, we're going to figure out how many radians we are around the circle. So we're going to be, because if we are going from 0 to 360, it's the same thing as going, so 0 to 360 degrees is the same as 0 to 2 pi radians, so we're going around the circle in radians, and we're using our radians value to um, produce a vector pointing pointing toward the point on the outside of the circle. So we're, we're making a vector that goes from the center to some point on the circle. We're using cosine, and we're using sine for this, and we're just using the radius of the circle. So basically this lets us sort of trace points around the circle as we compute radian, the radian value for how far we are around the circle. And for each one, we get the physics position of the body plus this vector. So this gets the center of the body, and then we're adding on this vector that adjusts for um, the, the vector from the center of the circle through to the edge of the circle um, at whatever, like, angle radian says. So we're getting a new physics position and coming up with a render position for that, pumping that into our debug draw point for whatever our current index is. And so basically what we're doing is we're coming up with render positions for 360 points surrounding this. So we're doing a lot of additional math here to transform all these points. Not only does this eat a lot more memory having these 360 points that we have to keep track of, but we also every frame have to compute these 360 points. Um, so we're doing a bunch of additional work. 
However, the reason that we do all this is so that at the end of the day, we can call SDL render draw points and tell the renderer to draw these 360 points. You need to pass the array of points and you need to tell it that there's 360 points. Because uh, regular plain Jane um, arrays in C++ don't know their own length. Um, so we need to tell it this 360 points. So uh, in any case, uh, this is not something that you need to do for your assignment or anything, but it is a handy debugging trick. Uh, it's definitely really helpful to be able to know for sure exactly where your colliders are uh, when things are running. And so that lets you be able to like really have a good understanding of when collisions are taking place. And I might as well just show you very quickly. Um, let's say that I adjust the radii of these things a little bit. Like maybe maybe we have a texture that's large, like compared to the radius. So our ball, I just adjusted its radius to be half of what it is. So now you'll see that it draws much smaller. Now the texture would convince us that it should bounce a lot sooner than it does, but because debug draw is there showing where um, where the radius actually is, that gives us a much better impression of exactly the edge of the shape. And so you can see with these, I've just tuned up the values here to make sure that um, that my physics body is actually like the same size as how my texture is drawing. And that's basically all I've done here. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's debug draw in, uh, in a nutshell. So um, moving on, uh, I want to start talking about collision response and how we sort of go about dealing with our collision response. Now, uh, in class one day, uh, we spent a little bit of time looking over um, in a, a main function, just sort of a, a cheap and dirty look at like how do you deal with collision between a couple of uh, objects. How do you uh, do the momentum transfer between two bodies that come into contact with one another? Um, so now I've done a little bit of additional work for myself and I've come up with um, the equations for how to uh, compute the final velocity um, when the masses of the two objects are different from one another. I am not going to give you that. That is something you got to compute for yourself because that's the real physics work here. Uh, what I will show you is everything uh, surrounding that. Um, so uh, let's let's write a function. So I'm going to write a function here um, that is going to take a body A, a body B, and it is going to take in a vector 3, not a vector, a vector 3 reference that is constant, uh, normal uh, B2A. And this does not change our assignment. Oops, vector 3. Right. So um, those who have very keen eyes may notice that I didn't actually make these take a, oops, a const argument before, because um, the point of resolve collision is to change the bodies, right? Like the intent here is to modify the velocities of these two bodies after the collision. So they are not constant here. So, I mean, maybe a little bit of a tangent, but again, uh, this is a way that you can use const on your function arguments to sort of make clear to someone who's using your function what it is that it's trying to do. The fact that I have const on normal b to a suggests to me that I'm using normal b to a and not changing it, but these are the things that I am changing, like that the bodies are the things that I intend to transform. Um, and also const here is saying that nothing about this is going to modify um, in, like the contents of assignment 4. So um, anyway, um, just uh, 
Uh, Freaking spell restitu restitution. There we go. So um, there are a lot of different ways that you can combine. Um, oh yeah, that's right. We haven't added this yet. Um, restitution is a thing that um, we have talked about. Um, and usually we think of that as sort of like a value that exists for the whole collision. Um, but a lot of the time in physics engines, you kind of have to define restitution on an individual object basis. And this would be baked into your body uh, class. Now that's a fairly easy thing to do um, because um, like how we added radius, um, restitution is just a float. Oops, restitution. I swear this is like one of the most difficult words to type in the English language. Um, so I'm throwing in a float in my body.h for restitution. Um, you're going to want to make sure that this gets initialized. I find that it's usually nice to include um, a initializer in your constructor for restitution. So I like to throw that in there. Uh, which is going to mean that we want to take a look at our body.cpp. We're going to want to add our argument there. And lastly, we want to make sure that it gets set. Probably the very most important thing that you want to do is make sure that this gets set. If this restitution value comes out as garbage data, your collisions are going to go bonkers. So make sure that this value gets set, because if it's not between 0 and 1, um, weird, weird things are going to happen. And your chances of that number between being between 0 and 1, if it reads garbage data, are pretty close to 0. Um, so definitely, definitely make sure that you initialize this. Um, okay, so now that's probably going to cause some build issues. I'm just going to build right now and just see what that broke. Um, right, because I have this add body function that's in my world, um, so I'm just going to modify that so that it also takes an argument, restitution, and that's going to complain now because I need to modify world.h because it no longer matches what's in world.h. Let's go over there, and I'll just make sure that that gets set. And again, I'm just going to give that a default value of 1. Okay, try building that again. What do we get? Okay, so I've got a couple of other places that are freaking out. Okay, so this is expecting a restitution value in here. So, um, well, since we def decided, we, we put down a whole bunch of other um, values here for our constants. Let's um, uh, let's just call it rest. Um, yeah, so let's, for now, just make the restitution of uh, these things both uh, one, just uh, to keep things simple. So I'm going to set the restitution of both of those things, and I want to make sure that in both cases where add body is being called, so if I hit this comma, you can see that it's highlighting. So I have my mass, I have my radius, my third argument is restitution, which is highlighted here. So I'm going to make sure that that value gets put in there. Um, and uh, this one is A for hang rest. So those are set. I'm building it again. This is my way of just sort of narrowing things down and eventually finding uh, whatever the problem is. Okay, and so this is this is just the line that I left half finished when I was starting uh, dealing with restitution here. Uh, the reason that I got into that rabbit hole is because I wanted to look over this. So um, when you have two bodies that have their own restitution values, you have to have a way to sort of determine what the total restitution is. And um, there's a couple different ways to do this, but the one that I often sort of go with is using the average restitution. So this is really just saying like the restitution of A plus the restitution of B over 2. So it's just taking the mean of the restitution between these two things. Now currently 
we have those values both set to 1, so it'll be 1 plus 1 times 0.5, same thing as 1 plus 1 over 2, um, so you get 1. Um, so nothing fancy there, um, but if we were to change one of them to 0.8, for example, then the restitution value you get 1 plus 0.8 is 1.8, divide by 2, and you get 0.9, so that's like the mean between uh, 0.8 to 1, right? So uh, that, that'll give you something um, something that you can work with that sort of accounts for the restitution values of both of your objects. Um, so in here, um, our intent is to use this normal. Um, we need to sort of find the velocities of both of these objects with relation to this normal. So rather than in regular Cartesian space, we are finding the velocity with respect to the normal, which requires that we do some dot product to project onto the normal, right? So the initial velocities here, um, so I like to think of these as just initial velocity a, and um, so we can just use a's velocity um, dot product against normal b to a, easy enough. And then secondly, we can do that with B. So that gets us our initial velocities, A and B. Now, so the secret ingredient here that I'm not really going to go into in uh, full detail, these lines, these final velocity lines. So these are the ones that you're gonna have to do a little bit of algebra to, uh, to determine like what what this is even going to be. Um, for now, um, I'll just put a comment here to do, um, you need to do, to do some algebra. Ooh, I'm not typing well today. To figure out what these will be. Now, for now, I'm just setting them to the initial velocities. So this, this resolve collision function that I have here is just not going to do anything. Um, basically, it's going gonna, it's gonna to say, OK, your velocity is the same as it was. We're done. <laughs> so they're just going to continue on going in the same direction that they went. Um, so realize that it's fairly important that you change um, those lines up. To match. And then lastly, you want to find the delta velocity. So you're saying final minus initial. And so that's final the delta for A, and this is the delta for B, B, B. Great. And lastly, you want to do the thing that is suggested by the fact that these are not constant. And you want to change the velocity of A by the delta velocity times normal B to A. So remember, this delta velocity, this is a float. This value here is really a speed, I should say. So this is like, this is a, when we, um, when we do this step here, this initial velocity A, it might even be more accurate to say that this is like an initial speed. So this is the speed along the normal. Um, and then this is the final speed along the normal. This delta that we're coming up here is the change in speed along the normal. But then we need to multiply by the direction of the normal and multiply by the speed to get like a vector in the magnitude, like in the direction of the normal with the magnitude of our change in velocity and we're changing our initial velocity by that value. So remember, if you're trying to follow along with the physics equations here, like realize that this is the same thing as saying this, right? That, so we're setting our velocity to whatever the velocity was plus this change. So this is our n hat, or pardon me, this, this normal b to a is our n hat, and this delta velocity a is like our change uh, 
it's like delta v superscript n, I think is how we were writing that. Just uh, reverse that change. So, and then of course I'm going to do the same thing to b. Um, right. Oh, of course it's not going to be to b. Good. Okay, so again, I'm um, going to triple state this. These lines are not real. Um, this is going to do exactly nothing in here. You're going to have to find a way to fill these in in such a way that um, this behaves properly. This is going to do nothing, and our objects are simply going to pass through um, the shape without any, any interruption. Now, I just jammed this resolve collision into my assignment for um, here because it's like, honestly, it's it's a fine place to do it. <laughs> it's like, it's not really a problem. Um, in fact, I, I had second thoughts about whether I should pack this into the world anyway. Um, I want to take a quick check that my world is not set up weirdly. Uh, good, I haven't baked this into the update yet. In fact, um, you know what? I'm I'm going to do this the way that I've done this out here, just so that I can show you. In fact, you can often go without a world, and in fact, you may find that it's easier to just sort of avoid having it entirely. You can bake your test collision in here um, into your assignment for, and do all the things that the world would do without even having one. If you want to, if you want to keep things a little bit more simple, um, so this way. Um, What's it complaining about? Oh, I need my default. Right? I think that's good. Uh, yeah. So I might as well see at this point um, what this behaves like. First of all, I should check the builds. It does. Um, okay, so my expectation is that nothing will be different. Good. Everything is the same as it was. Nothing has changed. Um, and uh, we're going to get there. We're going to get to the point where we have some changes. But um, maybe a good place to start with is thinking about how we deal with, for example, having a few more pegs in play. Um, how do we get something that behaves a little bit more like Peggle? One second, just checking on time. 27 minutes. Okay, good. Um, yeah, um, so there's a couple little things uh, that we can do here. Um, I'm just going to fool with a couple of numbers here. Um, this is not super important, but I just want to move some things around and um, make the space a little bit more convenient for, for what's going on here. Uh, yep. I'm going to set the peg mass to 10. Um, and my ball mass is 1 and the radius. Sure, these are all fine. Okay, so I'll stick with that. That's cool. Uh, sure. So um, those values will work. Um, so just to review there, I set the peg mass to 10. Um, I adjusted the ball initial position. Um, and that might have been it. So right now, uh, we have one game object pointer for a peg. So what if we want more than one peg? Um, I know that when we were first working on our world, we had a very brief discussion about this thing, which you probably looked at, and especially at the time, thought to yourself, I never want to see it again. Well, suck it up. Um, <laughs> vectors you're going to see a lot of in C++, that's not going to go away. Um, they are one of the standard types that is in the standard library, and they are probably sort of the most ubiquitous collection type that you are going to uh, deal with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to include vector into my project, and I'm going to make myself a vector of game object pointers and I'm going to call them pegs. So instead of having one peg, I'm going to have multiple pegs. Um, so 
Um, that's going to break a few things. Visual Studio. If, you, if you've turned this map on, Visual Studio is nice enough to do this. Uh, actually, as a pointer, I'm trying to remember, how is it that you turn that thing on? Um, mm -hmm. Let's see if I can remember how that thing is switched on, but I don't recall. Mm, nope, sorry, I don't remember. Um, you probably want to look up, um, if you're interested in having this this like review of uh, the code structure on the side here, um, that's generally called a mini-map. Um, so um, just Google it if you think that's cool. And uh, take a look. So um, instead of just creating one peg, I'm going to create a few. And uh, I'm going to do this in a way that um, probably, maybe you haven't seen syntax like this before. Um, interestingly, in C++, um, this is also workable in C Sharp, uh, you can just simply create a an enclosure like this. Um, you can create parentheses and that creates a scope. Um, so when you create a function like this, it creates a scope. Now, just like in my begin function here, since I've defined this window um, variable within my function scope, this window is not accessible outside of that scope, which means that if I use the variable somewhere else, it won't be in collision with it. Redefining it isn't a problem. Um, you can do the same thing anywhere. You can simply define a scope where you can make variables in it and declaring them isn't a problem. Um, I like doing this just for organizational purposes. You don't need to do this, but um, I think that it can make like pretty pretty nice looking code sometimes, and it helps break things up in a way that makes it a little bit easier to read. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a couple of pegs. Um, oh shoot, let's. Uh, so I'm going to create my body here. Um, where am I going to position this one? So this one is at 5.5, five, in fact. And um, now you may not remember, um, push back is the same function as, this is like C sharp's list.add. Push back is basically the same thing as add. Um, why it has such a stupid name? Um, really what it means is that you are adding a new item onto the back of the array. Is, that's, that's what it's intending to mean. Um, so don't get too hung up on the terminology. Um, so this is what I'm going to do here. So this is saying like, okay, so inside this scope, peg body is valid, um, and I'm creating a body um, with these values at this location, and I'm pushing a new game object using this body and the peg texture um, onto my list. So why did I do it like that? Well, because I can do this. And that makes things at least look pretty nice, doesn't it? Um, and this will let me, I can just simply change up the positions of these things. Um, you could instead make a for loop or something that creates new uh, pegs if you want. Uh, you can certainly do that instead. Um, but I figured, like, well, okay, it's kind of nice to be able to sort of manually position them instead of having to write a for loop that, like, moves through space and, and gets everything right. That's a little bit finicky. So I just wanted to do something simple and uh, make it so that I could define a few of them. Um, secondly, I'm going to take away my ball's initial velocity um, because I'm going to do that in a slightly different way now. Um, I have... A couple of changes that I would like to make to my update. Um, I'm going to scrap this is colliding for now. We've had enough of that. Let's just we'll, we'll get there again. I'll get this thing up and running um, pretty soon. Um, but for now, um, uh, ball .git body. Do you remember that wind lab that we did where we needed to have an acceleration. Well, now we're coming back to that. So let's um. So we're going to apply some gravity to our ball. We're simply going to add some acceleration, negative nine point eight meters per second, right? 
And um, so for now, we're not testing for collisions. We're not resolving collisions or anything like that. Um, we're just simply making the ball move with some gravity. That's all that's happening. Um, and lastly, we're going to have a couple issues down here. Um, this stuff is going to complain because um, peg is no longer defined. Uh, we now have a group of pegs. Um, if you recall, um, in C++ land, uh, we can uh, do a for loop that goes through all the pegs like this. So um, this way, basically, I'm saying for each peg in pegs, call it peg, and then we'll render it. So I'm just wrapping that and saying, so this will get called as many times as I have pegs, and that's it. Um, and then um, basically, same, same goes for these deep up draws. Um, well, actually, this is colliding as kind of a, a relic at this point. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna knock all this out. I'm gonna let it, I'm gonna let it do debug draw in red, and I'm just gonna get rid of all this additional junk. It needs that stuff. I might as well get rid of that is colliding variable because I'm not using it for anything at this point. Um, okay, so here we are. So our render, our debug draw is really simple now. We're just debug drawing using our uh, MVP matrix. And so we're calling debug draw on the ball and we're calling debug draw on all of the pegs. And um, we're before that, we're rendering the ball and rendering all the pegs. Um, so because the ball is rendering before the pegs, if the ball goes uh, behind a peg, it the peg will draw on top of it, so we could we could reorder that if we put the ball after. So ideally, okay, that's okay. Well, this was a mistake. Um, I'm a little surprised that this even worked, that I could just simply do plus equals negative 9.8 meters per second because I didn't pick a direction. Um, we need acceleration dot y to have this happen. So uh, another way that I could write this is minus equals 9.8. It's a little bit nicer. Um, so yeah, I want to go down. I want to go negative 9.8 in the y-axis. So uh, let's do that. Right, so as I said, the ball rendered behind the peg. So if we wanted the ball to render in front, uh, now when we have collision detection, ideally the ball shouldn't end up behind a peg. But, um, you know, let's, let's say there's a possibility that we might want to want to do that differently. So oops. let's, let's make the ball render afterwards. And if I run that again, there you go. Ball renders in front. So yeah, that's one way to sort of fool with your render order. Just checking on time. 38 minutes. Great. Okay. So I know I'm kind of moving fast here. Um, but we're at a pretty good spot, right? Like our game doesn't look like much, but we got a few pegs and we got a ball and we have the ability to test for collisions and like we can draw out where our bodies are in space. It's like a pretty good start. At this point, there's really only things that you need to do inside your update in order to make this work. So there's a few pieces to this that you probably want to go through. Now my recommendation is that you kind of break things into sort of a couple phases here that um, you want to have like a collision phase where you are doing all of your sort of collision checks and resolution. Um, I would even say that it's better to go further to have one stage where you do collision detection and then another where you do collision resolution, but that's actually a fair bit more complicated. It doesn't seem like it will be right at the start. Uh, but it forces you to make a list of collisions and you have to have a collision object and you're like holding on to your like list of collisions that have happened in this frame and it's just a lot more. So um, my, my suggestion though is that you have one phase where you do collision and then the other where you do integration. Now because I'm scrapping using the world here, in fact we can go 
basically like we're we're using the world update, but that's about it. Like we're using the world to sort of move things, but we could go without it. Like the only thing that we're doing from the world right now is this. That's it. Um, so in fact, I could just grab that chunk and throw it in here, and like the world doesn't really need to have any any say in this at all. Um, and then again, uh, oops, we uh, yeah, right. So you can do a couple of things in here. I'm just going to do the ball and I'm just going to take some comments out here just to, to keep things simple. So or I guess I have the ball's body. Do I? No, I don't have an object for that. Okay, well, you could just make an object for the ball's body, and that would make a lot of sense. In fact, it would probably be even better to set this right at the moment that you create the ball. Um, we'll do that in a sec. So let's say peg body per Let's go through. We're gonna have to go through pegs because the pegs are a game object type. So that's gonna mean that we need to do this to get the peg body. We're gonna have to sort of do that on the spot. So make sure that we get the body from the peg, and then we can do velocity, position, all this fun stuff. Now, why am I going through the process of putting this stuff into here instead of using the world? Because um, you're probably going to find at some point you want a little bit more control over what's in collision with what. And um, I found that it was easier to do it here than to try and specialize code in the world in order to, to do this. Um, or that it will probably be a lot easier for you guys. Um, I know my way around how to set up collision layers and things like that, but... Um, it's probably a lot easier for you guys to just test collisions between the things that you want to test collisions between. Um, so a good way to do this is just simply um, we're going to deal with collision detection in just one second. Um, but here the important thing to focus on is that we're integrating the body's position and we're integrating the pegs. And uh, well... Ideally, that should behave just like it did. Nothing should have changed. We should have the ball falling according to gravity, and the pegs should stay where they are. Great. Nothing changed. That's a win. So then, um, you're down to doing some collision detection, right? So at this point, you want to know whether your ball is colliding with a peg, and you want to be able to resolve the collision in some way. Now... Again, our resolve collision function will not do anything really, but um, we can detect that the collision happened, and uh, we can we can at least call that function. So now, yeah, collision detection in this case, in this game, like pegs probably shouldn't collide with one another. Like, when a peg gets knocked by the ball, the peg should simply get knocked by the ball and sort of fall down. Like, if it falls through other pegs, that seems fine to me. You could make them bounce off of one another, but you may find that you end up with a little bit of a traffic jam of all the pegs that are getting hit by other pegs, and, like, the ball simply hitting one peg will knock down half of the level, which, um, while exciting, is really an easy game. That's cool, too. If you do that, that's perfectly fine. But I'm going to set mine up so that the ball um, collides with pegs, but the pegs don't collide with one another. Um, 
so it's a little bit more complicated to do everything colliding with everything also so you may find that this is this is a little bit uh, a little bit simpler to think about um so here's another case where here i'm gonna have to get the peg body from inside this thing um actually i guess i'm probably gonna need to get the ball body a little bit sooner i might as well get it right here because it seems like i'm going to be using it a lot um sure so here we are going to need to use our uh, test collision function and this time we're going to have to use the whole thing remember when we were just testing to see if these two bodies were in collision if a and b are in collision we don't care about this normal uh, we just didn't need to pass it in, and it wouldn't do anything with it. We'd just be able to use its Boolean result. But this time, we want to know what the collision normal is when this happens. We want it to be able to dump this out to us so that we can use that for something. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work with that. So I'm going to create a vector 3, and um, like I have been, I'm just going to call it normal VA. I don't have to set it to anything. It just needs to exist. Um, and then I'm going to make myself a little if statement here. If test collision, this is the beauty of why it's written this way, in fact. Um, so ball body is A, and peg body is B, and we're going to pass in normal B to A. And that's going to give me an error at first. And you're going to go, what? okay, what's going on? Remember that we need to pass in a pointer to this vector 3. So remember, you need to reference that with an ampersand beforehand. So that will say, I'm going to pass in the address to this variable here. So when test collision runs and a collision is detected, normal B to A is going to get set to whatever that normal is. And then you'll be able to use it after that in the code. And then lastly, all we need to do is if that collision happened, then we're going to resolve it. And this time we can just pass normal B to A because this one doesn't expect a pointer or anything. It's pretty easy. So, um, great. So I'm going to build this and hopefully everything's cool. Um, and run it. Nothing changed. What a surprise. So, Again, I'm going to throw a breakpoint down here just to sort of illustrate the point. The important thing to note is that it should hit this breakpoint. Resolve collision should run. Um, so oh, why don't I throw one down right here? That's a good spot. So this is going to fall until, okay, test collision came back. Our normal is showing that a collision happened. Awesome. So if I continue on, we go into this function, um, but we just don't have a way of computing the initial velocities here. So again, this is your task. This is this is for you, and um, if you can figure out how to do that, you're in a good spot. I'll take those breakpoints off, and this thing just sort of continues. Um, just as a general point of interest, I'm going to open up. Um, my own sort of solution to this um, and I'm going to run it. Oh, okay, one second, let me fix it. Uh, I am running Visual Studio 2017 and I have just, I am recording this on my laptop so I don't have the Windows SDK 8.1, I only have the Windows 10 SDK so I'm just making sure to set that. Um, let me just, okay, resolution is set good. All right, let's try it out. This is not the project that I thought that I was looking at. Um, Oh, I bet I know what it could be. Let me uh, just do one thing quickly. 
um, you will find sometimes with uh, with if you're copying projects, like if you copy a whole solution, um, that you need to sort of like delete the files out of it and um, simply uh, grab them and add them back in again. Uh, because the project will be pointing to files that are actually in the folder as it was originally named. Um, fingers crossed, this turns into what I'm hoping. Good. Yeah, so this is a little bit like what you should be getting um, if your uh, if your ball has proper collision response set up here. Now, um, so I position that so it's slightly off center of the first peg, so when it bounces, it hits the first peg, it bounces off a little bit to the right, and then it hits the second peg, which bounces it off a little bit to the left, then it bounces off the third peg, um, and so um, it hits all three one at a time. Anyhow, um, that's a pretty good rundown of everything that uh, that's there to do. Um, now, there's some stuff about controls and things like that that you may be interested in um, sort of toying around with. Um, don't worry too much about the controls. The emphasis is being able to plinko this ball uh, down, down through. I mean, yeah, I want a playable game, but... Um, you know, don't worry too much about getting the controls exactly perfect, getting the gameplay exactly perfect. Um, ultimately, I want to see that you uh, are able to do the, the math and give me a good equation for the momentum transfer, and I want to see that the momentum transfer behaves nicely um, in the game and mostly accomplishes the, the, the points that I put down for how this game is played. Um, so um, put your focus on getting the physics right, um, and then once you get that going nicely, uh, think about how to set up controls for your game so that you can shoot the ball um, in different directions by clicking with the mouse, um, and then sort of cycling through the, the gameplay loop until, you, uh, until you're able to determine whether the player won or lost. So anyway, um, it's been... Uh, quite a journey, these 15 lessons, and um, I wish you all very well in your upcoming years. I hope to see you all in Physics 2. And uh, I guess I'll see you on Wednesday. See you later, everybody.